Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate you um, all making the effort on a Monday night to come out and um, come to this really important event that we have the honour to, um, to host. Um, Professor Marcia Langton and Josephine Cashman have generously agreed to come and speak on this topical event. Um, and I wanted to say thank you as well to um, the faculty for all their support, um, particularly Jenny Engel, who's been unbelievable, and um, all, the whole faculty as well. And I'd like to thank um, Dina, um, Dina, Judge um, Dina Yahia for coming and all of the members of the um, faculty have made a special effort as well. Carolyn Penfold and uh, incoming Dean Professor George Williams as well. Um, so I'd like to start as well, um, obviously, the first thing to do, we have to um, acknowledge, um, acknowledge that we are currently on Bidjigal land. Um, We've been uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who've been on this land for 40,000 years. And um, so it's really important to acknowledge that we're here on Bidjigal land. And um, I'd like to welcome um, Rebecca Hatfield, who's emceeing the event tonight. Sorry, I'm so nervous. Oh my God. <laughs> um, and also, a shout, big shout out to the Law Society. Um, I'm the Director of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Issues, so that's why this event's happening. Thanks again and enjoy. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Ruby. So, um, as she mentioned, my name is Rebecca Hatfield and I'll be your MC tonight. Um, first of all, I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we're gathered here today, the Bidjigal people. And I would like to um, welcome Professor George Williams to come and say some opening remarks. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'd also like to pay my respects uh, to the traditional owners, the First Nations of these lands. And I'd like to say how delighted I am as the incoming Dean of UNSW Law to see us hosting this event tonight and to thank the students in particular for all the enormous efforts they've done to put this on. And as a faculty, we're only too pleased to support events of this kind. And, sorry, you're right there? Yes. <laughs> Let me also say as the incoming Dean that it's absolutely clear to me that the focus and indeed the increased focus that we're giving to Indigenous incarceration and violence is vitally necessary. That for many years these issues have not been well understood. Uh, we have not listened to the lived experience of people in these communities. We've shut our eyes, both as leaders and as communities, to what's happening around this country. And it's only now, belatedly, decades, indeed centuries later, that we're coming to grips with some of these problems. We're actually starting to understand some of these issues, perhaps for the first time. But as someone who's worked in these areas myself, it's equally and painfully clear that we're still a long way off solutions. And hence the importance of the talk tonight, to not only understand the problem, to also start to come to grips with what we can do as a community to come up with answers in this area. As a public lawyer myself and as someone who has worked around and throughout these issues for many years, if there's one thing that's been clear to me about what we need to do in the longer term to solve these problems is that, that it also relates to our governance arrangements. You can't expect problems of these kinds to be fixed without an agenda of community empowerment, without understanding the need for communities to have the power to take responsibility themselves in these areas. And that's why for many years I fought as an academic and as a barrister for treaties in this country, uh, also for constitutional recognition as part of the solutions. And I'd say that for me, these are my parts of the story in terms of the things that I'm certainly going to be continuing to commit to. And I'd say as the incoming dean, um, I have a very strong personal commitment to what the faculty can do in this area. Um, my work not only includes treaties and other matters, including a book that uh, Marcia wrote the forward to called Treaty some years ago, but I also appeared for the Namanjiri women in the High Court in the Hindmarsh Island Bridge case in terms of fighting for justice for those peoples in that case. The faculty to this point has a proud record in this area of seeking to empower, of seeking to embuild, we have over 85 Indigenous graduates 
Uh, we also have a number of leading Indigenous members of staff. But I just wanted to leave you with the notion that we are by no means complacent in this space. Um, we have a proud record, but we have not yet done enough. Um, we need to do more to lead in this area. And in particular, we need to do more to listen to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to understand the problems, and also as a faculty to do what we can to assist them in remedying these problems. So welcome, thank you for coming tonight, thank you for the students and to my colleagues for attending, and uh, I look forward to hearing what our speakers have got to say. Thank you, Professor Williams, for those opening remarks. So now I'd like to introduce um, our special guests for tonight. Um, our first speaker um, is Josephine Cashman. Josephine is a Waramai entrepreneur from the um, from New uh, sorry from New South Wales. She is a lawyer, a businesswoman, and a social entrepreneur. In 2013, Josephine was appointed by the Prime Minister to the Indigenous Advisory Council and serves as chair of the Safe Communities Committee. She also sits on the board of the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust. As a founder, um, as a founder of Review Global Partners, Josephine identifies and nurtures key relationships that attract and drive economic opportunities into Indigenous communities. Josephine's expertise in business, negotiation and engagement drives real outcomes and meets the diverse practical needs of Indigenous communities. Our second guest is Professor Marcia Langton. She is a Yemen descendant and is an anthropologist and geographer. She has um, held the Foundation Chair of Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne since 2000. She, is, she has produced a large body of work in areas of political and legal anthropology, Indigenous agreements and negotiated settlements and Indigenous culture and art. Professor Langton served on the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, the Empowerment Communities Project with the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, and as a member of the expert panel on constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. She has a formidable academic reputation and plays a national role advising on policy commitment and impact. So I'd like to welcome um, both Professor Marcia Langton and Josephine Cashman to the stage, and they'll give a brief um, introduction to um, their research, and then we will um, uh, have a Q&A. Uh, &A. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, for this invitation. Um, no, if there's a slide missing, I can get it up. So uh, let me uh, just uh, first of all explain that Josephine and I have been working together on this problem for some months, uh, doing some research, looking at the options, um, consulting with people, uh, and, and making recommendations, and then going back to do second round consultations. Uh, we're very keen to ensure that uh, the right recommendations are made because we regard uh, these issues as uh, the most important issues in our community. Um, safe communities mean healthy families, um, children doing well, women being safe, um, and there can be nothing more important than that in our view. So let me just present a few statistics. Um, the Indigenous imprisonment rate is 15 times higher than for non-Indigenous Australians. So since the Royal Commission uh, 20 years ago, the proportion of Indigenous prisoners in our prisons has almost doubled. Um, and while uh, Indigenous Australians make up only 2.5% of Australia's population, the nation's jail population um, is 26% Indigenous. Um, and in, obviously in some jurisdictions it's much, much higher. Um, and we're addressing ourselves to a series of um, 
understandings about this problem. We don't entirely agree in some respects, and we want to make it very clear where we stand um, on the basis of our discussions with many women, many victims, and uh, people in frontline services. So the Change the Record campaign, uh, it's got the Law Council of Australia involved, of course, Amnesty International, um, a variety of uh, organisations in the justice, National Justice Coalition. So yes, they're saying that the, uh, the incarceration rates should be radically reduced. Yes, they are saying that the violence rates should be reduced. Um, and no one could disagree in principle. The question is how? And so we want to emphasise the how, um, but we want to do what we believe that the campaign is not doing. We want Australians to understand who the victims are. Um, so, uh, yes, the official campaign website acknowledges that the majority of Indigenous prisoners are in jail for convic convictions for acts intended to cause injury. Um, however, other facts are not coming to the fore in the way that the campaign is being conducted. The convictions are for assaults and sexual assault in the main, and on average, for each indig Indigenous prisoner, there are two Indigenous victims. So I want you to hold that thought because this is what alerted us to a set of challenges in confronting these twin problems of incarceration and extraordinary rates of violence in our communities. Most victims are Indigenous women. Um, so, in addition to us forcing us to ask the question, what about the victims? This forces us to consider the consequences of not applying the law and sentencing practices equally to Indigenous offenders who commit acts that injure women and children. And so we want to make it clear that if the demand is simply and crudely that uh, the offenders should not be sentenced in the same way as other Australians who commit the same crimes, then we can't avoid but draw the conclusion that the lives of Indigenous women, children and other victims simply do not matter. Um, and I am sure that all of those good people involved in the campaign wouldn't want Australians to draw that conclusion. Uh, let's look at the offence patterns of prisoners in the Northern Territory, where we've done most of our work. Uh, so the Northern Territory has the highest proportion of all jurisdictions with the most serious offence and charges for acts intended to cause injury. So acts intended to cause injury, 53%. Sexual assault and related offences, 12%. Homicide and related offences, 8%. Offences against justice procedures, etc., 22%. Traffic and vehicle, 10%. So there are some people who are saying most Aboriginal people are in jail for traffic offences. Uh, that's not true um, in any jurisdiction, although it might be true in some areas. In the NT, as I've already said, for every Aboriginal offender, there are two Aboriginal victims, at least. In Alice Springs, the Northern Territory Police informed us that the violence rates are the highest recorded in the world, uh, per capita worse than in Ethiopia. Uh, the National View, 2012-2013, Indigenous women uh, were hospitalised for non-fatal family violence assault at 34.2% times the rate of non-Indigenous women. In New South Wales, Queensland, Western Australia, South Australia and the NT for 2008 to 2012, the death rate from homicide for Indigenous people was seven to eight times the rate for non-Indigenous people. Um, so, uh, there's a claim from Aboriginal men that they feel victimised and stereotyped. And we've had many complaints and threats from men who feel this way. Uh, that, you know, by discussing these matters, we're stereotyping all Aboriginal men as rapists and abusers. There's a very logical answer. Um, if Aboriginal men publicly state their opposition to violence against women and children and allow no excuses for it, they automatically indicate that not all Aboriginal men are perpetrators. 
the cone of silence. Men who want us to stop discussing these problems are perpetuating the cone of silence. Most Aboriginal victims do not report to police and other services out of fear of these pressures from people claiming to represent the community. Police do not respond because of the cone of silence. It becomes a vicious cycle. There's also a myth of the harmonious Aboriginal society. It's not true, it didn't exist. You simply have to read the literature. We don't have time to talk about that here. But according to the experts, Aboriginal male perpetrators of violence and rape display the same perverse gender roles as all other offenders, and arguing that Aboriginal perp perpetrators are different from other offenders because of colonisation, race, Aboriginality, is merely providing them with false excuses. And this, I'll call it a, you know, an argument, uh, perpetuates the attitude among some Aboriginal men that it is acceptable to assault women and children. And what we're hearing out in the community is that the change the record and justice reinvestment campaign is actually convincing these men that all of these human rights campaigners are on their side and that what they've done is okay. So that's the impact out there in the community. What needs to be said to them is that what they're in jail for is not okay. Assault and rape are criminal offences. So I'll hand over to Josephine. Um, what we're going to do is I, I was formerly a prosecutor. I think Marcy has brilliantly summarised the position. But what we're talking, what is really going to make the difference to lower the incarceration rate? Obviously, there's a big proportion of Aboriginal people who aren't following the law and do not necessarily have respect for the law, whether it's a traffic offence or whether it's a serious violence offence. How can we promote better social norms? And my view from formerly being... Do you want to play the video now? Put the video on? From formerly being a prosecutor was the best way to do this is to empower Aboriginal victims. Um, we're going to play a short clip, and I may stop it because we're running out of time, of Lani Brennan's case, which was the... Um, uh, the first trial sentence was 33 years, 28 non-parole period, and then it went down to 28 years and 26. But it was the highest sentence for um, a victim who was still living in Australia, and um, she's got a Facebook page of 10,000 followers, and she gives advice all the time of how, how women can take out DBOs. These sort of women are the ones who are creating the change in social norms, the ones who've had a good experience in the criminal justice system. So go for it, Ruby. The first I heard of Lani's story, I had read the police facts and I had read Lani's statement. And my first reaction to that was, this girl is still alive. I thought, you know, for anyone to survive that, um, you know, it's pretty remarkable. So that was where she got hit with an iron she'd bar? She'd been hit with an iron bar, she'd been hit with a bottle, uh, she'd been hit with uh, hammers, chisels, a golf club, uh, she'd had um, uh, electric cord tied round her neck. Stitches to her head, her broken jaw, a stab mark, she had a shoulder. Wired. One of her thighs had been lacerated with a broken ceramic plate. The burns, broken cheekbones. And you would not want to see anyone like that ever again. And being her mother, it was just devastating. Right, stop it there. That's Lani yeah, at 19 old. years old. Um, and I and I was working at the DPP and I'd worked at the DPP in New South Wales all through law school and I met Lani and nobody was managing her case. She hadn't seen a lawyer. I was the, um, her, uh, the solicitor with carriage and um, I saw her and she said, this trial's going to take a week. And I said, no, it's going to take months because I knew that, every, that there were just going to be dramas all through the trial. And I was lucky... It took the police four years to execute a warrant and within that time, the offender who lived out at La Perouse at the time was arrested 44 times and he was actually put in jail for offences such as having sure enough shotguns and other things. But it took... They actually... her new Lani and her new partner went to the New South Wales Ombudsman and lodged a complaint and finally he was arrested. Um, and... 
that was a case where it, it took three and a half months um, to finish and she was eight and a half months pregnant through the trial. And everything you could expect went wrong, went wrong. The offender's family took an AVO against Lani in the middle of the trial and the Attorney General, um, that time, uh, Bob Davis uh, or his department released her address to the offender's family. Everything you could imagine went wrong. Oops. So what works? In intensive case management of Indigenous and Aboriginal victims. Because if they see justice, then Aboriginal people feel, well, the law is there to protect me and then I will have respect for the law. And I've seen that happen in practice. What we've been advocating for is in the um, DPP, the Office of Director of Public Prosecution in New South Wales, they have special interest matters like bikey crime, um, Middle Eastern crime and terrorism matters in a special crimes unit. Um, I'm, I've been advocating for many years and since maybe at least 13 years ago I was advocating for Nicholas Cowdery to consider that because it was too often that we'd have Aboriginal victims who came from country areas who had so much against them actually standing up and making a complaint to police. You wouldn't imagine. Sometimes they lose their home, they're shunned um, and that happened to Lani. I think I've missed a slide but... I'll give you an example of, I had another trial which, I'll, which was a bad example of an Aboriginal victim also at La Perouse. The offender in that matter, every unsolved homicide, his name came up and he'd been to trial in Nowra for raping three women and had um, been found not guilty and he had a very long conviction history. I um, saw the victim uh, about a day before trial and I said to her, please speak plainly to the jury. Don't try to sound more educated because she had a fear that the jury would think that she was a dumb black woman and she told me that. And so we were in the trial and she's giving evidence in chief and she'd say things like, I conversated with that person and she'd have these very complicated words and I could see the jury was looking at her and her authenticity wasn't coming through. But that poor woman, woman had so many bound barriers for her coming to trial. She had uh, a proportion of the community against her. She had stress from family. She was homeless. So it uh, wasn't unsurprising to me that um, he was found not guilty um, after a three-day trial. And since then I've heard that unfortunately he's kept on offending and um, she is now a terrible heroin addict and has had a terrible time and would probably tell other women who want to take out a... Uh, a want to put a complaint to the police that you shouldn't go because no one will listen to you because white society doesn't care. So if we're going to create social changes in society... And there was another similar... Um, assault in King's Cross where I had a young Indigenous female who was a child prostitute, um, was in her um, teens and um, again she, I, had, I had spent limited time with her and couldn't work on some of her, uh, get her extra support. So the, the vulnerability of Aboriginal victims has to be addressed. Um, there's a huge amount of pressure on many of these victims not to report and there's a lack of services and coordination. And what we've suggested is that from arrest, like an um, accused person, that they have a social worker who's co-located in the police. Um, so I might get Marcia to just uh, talk about the social norms. Uh, so uh, you may have noticed in some of the public debates that uh, members of the Stolen Generations um, argue against removing children at risk from families um, and they say it's another case of stolen generations. Um, well, we can't allow children to be placed at risk because of the fear of a previous generation who um, live with that trauma. So they are allowing their trauma to cloud the arguments about the rights of children. Um, nor can we allow their fears and trauma to stand in the way of the rights of women and other victims, uh, such as children, to report violence and assault um, to the police and to frontline services. 
Um, and so we are stating very clearly that we don't believe that the victims of that stolen generations trauma and subsequent intergenerational trauma uh, should confuse the need to report family violence, assault, sexual assault in our communities with uh, what they experience, the brutal hand of the state in their lives under past assimilation policies. These are two very different issues. And of course, their um, stated fears play into the hands of the perpetrators and give the perpetrators of violence another excuse to escape the law and to, um, to escape uh, the attention of police and so the cone of silence continues. Um, so we must not let trauma and guilt stop the work of raising social norms. People raised in institutions um, lack parenting skills and overcompensate when raising their own children. They often have no borders and no limits. So we all recognise that social needs in our social norms in our communities need to be strengthened to raise children to be law-abiding. Unfortunately, children become involved in the criminal justice system from an early age and hence the extraordinarily high juvenile detention rates and we don't have time to give you those figures, but they're even worse than the adult imprisonment rates. So um, our recommendations include that justice reinvestment is the new slogan, but the debate ignores the programs that are working well. Um, so I'll hand over to Josie, but you know, just for instance, we think sentence to a job in the Northern Territory is working well. We think the literacy and numeracy training, uh, accelerated training programs in the prisons in the Northern Territory are working well, and, and quite a few other programs. And Marcy is actually on Four Corners tonight. A um, friend of mine who I studied with journalism with, Caro Meldrum Hanna, who's an award-winning journalist, is actually doing a story tonight, which she should watch about an Aboriginal victim in 2011 who was brutally murdered, a mother of seven who's never received justice. And there's many examples of that. So just a, justice needs to be seen and done. Um, people have the right in an adversarial system to have a good defence. But when we've got very vulnerable victims, I think the community also has an obligation to protect them, whatever it takes. So if you're an Aboriginal victim in many remote and urb, um, rural communities and you make a complaint against someone, you, you run the risk of being bashed, of being ostracised and becoming homeless. That is the reality. Because there's a social norm in not dobbing in your fellow Indigenous person because you're dobbing them into your, sometimes it's called, wider pressure. You're a dog, you're this, you're that. So as students, a lot of you are going to be, it's very important that you're not feeding into that perpetual cycle. And the issues definitely need to be separated. And that's why I think that many of the, the law students here will be working with Indigenous groups. So not just having a theoretical understanding, but a conceptual understanding of the diversity of Aboriginal Australia, what it's like to work in remote Australia, worked in Arnhem Land, or rural Australia, maybe down the coast, Wallaga Lake. But many of the young people, when I was working as a defence lawyer in remote Australia, found it very difficult just to grapple with the cultural differences um, and, and understanding the community dynamics. So I think particularly for DPP solicitors, they should have mandatory training when working with Aboriginal victims of crime. And I did suggest that to Nicholas Cowdrum and we had a couple of um, good uh, talks and uh, workshops, but they weren't ongoing and they weren't mandatory. And some of the managing lawyers who went through that training said, I realised that I had some unconscious bias that was preventing me from from connecting to that victim. I had no idea that they came from this background of trauma and dysfunction. And in saying that, there are some very successful Aboriginal families, but we can't ignore the fact, we can't ignore the fact that the victimisation rate, 34 times more likely to be hospitalised as a result of assault than every other Australian. We can't ignore that. Seven to eight times the homicide rate in most state and territories. This is a crisis. Now, all um, perpetrators of most, you know, um, serious perpetrators of violence have an internal talk. She made me do it. 
We can't also give Aboriginal offenders the excuse, the system made me do it. Or my, you know, grandmother or whoever was stolen generation and that's why I'm doing it. Because we're, who we're leaving out of that equation is the women normally and sometimes men and children who have to live in absolute chaos. And it's my view, and I think it's your view, Professor Marcy Langton, that if we can't get the community safe, we're not going to get the economic development we need and we're not going to get the kids to go to school. So if we want to be really fair to income about this, we also need to be minded as a society and governments also need to give accused people a fair trial, but we also need to support vulnerable victims. Yeah, so we wrote a letter uh, to the last Prime Minister, uh, Tony Abbott, uh, arguing that there should be coordinated victim support, one-stop shops from ar arrest to conviction and sentencing to support the victims. And one of the things that we're uh, very worried about, as much as we support the, uh, the aims of the Change the Record campaign, is that there are no serious recommendations coming from the campaign about how to pay attention to the victims and make sure that they feel safe to report and that their needs are met throughout the terrible process of going through the court trial. We have both uh, read the um, uh, re redacted version of the Australian Co Crime Commission um, Indigenous Intelligence Task Force report. Um, the full report runs to over a thousand pages, um, but the summary report um, makes it very clear that uh, this problem is the number one problem and that furthermore, it gives rise to, because of the cone of silence, the infiltration of criminal networks into um, Aboriginal communities to deal drugs and to um, commit other crimes. Um, and it leaves women and children at risk across the country. The findings in that report, which has never been public re publicly released, although it was intended to be, um, are truly hair-raising, although not as hair-raising as each case that we see come along. So we'll leave it at that and uh, take questions. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, so we're just going to move over to the chairs. We're, we've got some questions um, prepared a bit earlier, and then we'll open it up to the floor if anyone would like to any, uh, ask any questions about um, the research that Professor Langton and Josephine have done. So, first of all, I'd like to ask, um, you know, we talked a lot about... Um, the cone of silence and um, men complaining about perpetrating stereotypes. I guess, how do you propose that we um, include men in this conversation without further stigmatising them? Um, well, there are many men involved in this debate. Is that on? There are many men involved in this debate. Um, um, there are you know, men's sheds and uh, men's support units around the country. Um, there, are, for instance, there's a, um, a statement from Aboriginal men, a public statement, which I published in the Griffith Review some years ago. Um, there are men who publicly divorce themselves uh, from this kind of violence and uh, um, do a very good job in the community of encouraging young men to come to you know, their centres, their men's sheds and so on, to undergo anger management training, to be uh, mentored by older men. Um, however, like us, um, who you know, obviously advocate on behalf of the victims, they are you know, facing a tidal wave of violence. There are simply not enough Aboriginal people to um, contend with this problem by ourselves. We need uh, systemic reform in the police and court system. We need education um, and, and some steps to be taken like coordinated support for victims in, in order that responsible Aboriginal people 
can cope with these, with this rising tide of violence. I just came back from Alice Springs. I was um, chairing the uh, round table with Alice Springs women for the third action plan to reduce violence against women and children, which is due out soon. And uh, at the uh, at the um, town camps, these women had placed these huge purple um, signs outside the town camp. We will not accept violence or, or to that effect. A lot of them are getting bricks and um, pebbles and are getting harassed and out in in these communities for making a stand. So, um, you know, good men will stand behind good women, but I'm more concerned about the people who are actually putting themselves at risk to stand up against it and less about men worrying about how they look. Thank you. You also um, talked about pre previous trauma um, affecting the current debate over taking children. Um, where do you think it's actually appropriate to talk about um, this when talking about the criminal justice system. So I'm, I'm talking about um, you are saying that previous trauma should not be an excuse and it should be a separate issue from the current debate. Yep. Yep. Well, I actually met with the Northern Territory Attorney General and he said this publicly. Um, when he was a young ch child, um, his parents sent him to a nursery because um, he did something wrong, you know, he might have broken something which was worth some money to pay off his debt to his parents. This, the Attorney General was actually um, raped, gang raped, that nursery taken to police, but taken to beats, raped continuously. The moral of that story is there's plenty of people who've been victims in their life and they don't necessarily carry it with them. Are we going to say, you know, who... So many victims don't become offenders. The statistic says that. But offenders generally do blame a aspect in their life and part of the, behavior, the men's behavioural change is getting at that. So what I'm saying is that if people are going to wait all their lives for the government or the court system to heal them of their pain, it's never going to happen. People, we have to encourage personal responsibility, resilience... Um, Aboriginal people are very resilient pe people. Um, they've survived thousands of years in the harshest country, you know, in the world and survived many racist policies like removal of children. Why are we now not saying, not being as resilient? And I think the answer is, and probably a, 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 um, for another time, is, the, is welfare, is a welfare mentality and, and I'd like to mention the, the role that alcohol and drugs play in this issue. So uh, I, have, I have the statistics, but in any case, uh, I'll just, you know, cut it short the, so that the audience can ask some questions. Um, um, while most Indigenous people don't um, drink, um, and still it's the case that most Indigenous women don't drink, um, more so than men, um, although that's changing in some areas, um, Nevertheless, a, a minority of Aboriginal people drink to excess, drink dangerously, and alcohol is a key factor in the violence rates against women. And, of course, now, I mean, you know, people are finding that, you know, the drug-induced violence is also uh, one of the uh, contributing factors. But moreover, um, uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder... Um, and um, and FAS itself are, are being diagnosed at alarming rates in the Indigenous communities. And so the contribution of alcohol to the vulnerability of children and, and to the disability of children um, means that we'll see this problem accelerate and become much, much worse. So one of the things we've discussed with um, officials um, is, you know, is the is the lack of a FASD uh, diagnosis tool um, in Australia. It's operating in Canada. Why isn't there a diagnosis tool in Australia to diagnose prisoners with FASD so that they are classified as disabled? Um, it's held up at the Commonwealth level. There's been no action. It, this could have happened some years ago um, and it's been stalled 
for some reason at the bureaucratic level. So, I um, mean, you know, there are, there is, there's a complex of issues. We need to deal with them. These are very serious issues and we have to be very practical about it. Okay, thank you. So we'd like to open it up to the floor now if anyone has any questions. Really nervous. I'm the only person asking a question now. Um, going in reverse order, you were just saying about the question to welfare and drug and alcohol. Um, this is a sensitive question for some people, but do you believe that the controlling of um, benefit and finance is at all helpful? Yeah. Okay. So I presume that you're talking about the. Um um, the income management scheme in the Northern Territory and the introduction of the um, restricted debit card in Kununurra and Seduna. Um, yes, I do believe that it is. Um, while the evaluations, um, you know, you have to read them carefully. They've been reported in the media. I think the media reports have been somewhat misleading. Um, the evaluation reports, mm, you know, the, the findings are very sloppy. And I don't think these evaluations are very rigorous. But my observation is that um, if women are in control of their incomes in the way that income management and the restricted debit card gives them control through, you know, restricting the cash component of their income, they are less likely to be the victims of violence and, the, you know, the marauding of the family home by drunks who eat all the children's food. Um, so my observation is that women are empowered, but when they are consulted and asked in these evaluation processes, they are frightened to speak. They're frightened to say, oh, we really like the income management scheme. We really like the restricted debit card because it keeps the drunks away from us. So. You know, that's actually my observation. I'm not impressed with the evaluation reports. Well, on that, my um, my stepsister, who is a secretary at Yipirinia School in Alice Springs, she loves a debit card. She just thinks it's fantastic. And there's many women who do as well. Um, and I think, Marcy, you were there when um, income management was being brought in and many women behind closed doors will talk about it, um, how they want it. It actually came from women pushing for the card. But what I think is working, and when I mentioned welfare is in the Northern Territory, they have a 76% recidivism rate. Um, many of the prisoners are illiterate. Um, they're bored. They don't have control of their lives because they're on, you know, welfare. We can all control our own lives and we've got a, you know, decent income. So the Centres for a Job um, with the cohort they've been working with, with prisoners who've been in prison five times or less, the um, recidivism rate goes down from 76 to 20 per cent. And these prisoners over two years have paid back $750,000 worth of fines. They pay a 5% victims levy. Um, University of New England has developed an accelerated literacy program. 83 um, graduated in the last month with degrees from Charles Sturt and other um, University of Darwin. Um, some two with engineering degrees. And they're placed with employer groups. They're not paid a cent from government. They go out and work. They pay rent to the jail. There's houses outside the jail. And um, it's actually cost neutral for, um, for the government. And that is a really a, 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 a good practical program where people have economic development in many... Um, and now that's coming in with the development of the north. Um, the, the domestic violence rates tend to be lower. So when I was discussing welfare, I'm also talking about people having control of their own life, a sense of purpose, um, and it's not just around drinking and waiting for your dole check. Um, my question is more about your, your sample size. Did you at any time take into um, account any or encounter anybody with um, sexuality and gender diverse population and what services were there because there is, I know there's a lot of anecdotal um, 
evidence, but there's not a lot of statistical evidence. So I'm just curious is if, if you took any of that into account and we do know that the crime is high in that area. Needless to say, Vanessa's a, an, a, 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 of a statistical mind. Um, no, we didn't do a survey, so we don't have a sample. You know, we did um, consultations, two rounds of consultations. Um, um, and we've interpreted the available statistics, and there's a lot of statistical material. We did not come across, in our formal consultations, we didn't, nobody mentioned these issues to us. Um, but of course, yes, we know that they exist. Um, um, but similarly, um, you might have missed our main presentation. We talked about the cone of silence and why victims don't report. And of course, you know, it's um, even more difficult for um, um, LGBT, whatever the rest of it is, plus signs and whatever, um, people to, to report because they are, you know, so persecuted for their sexual or gender status. So, yes, that's a very difficult problem, but we, we don't have any particular recommendations about that at this stage. Can I ask one other thing with your recommendations? I've noticed you've got nothing about the perpetrator intervention models. So, would you consider that as one of your recommendations? Yeah, we can't. We actually wrote a 60 page report and we've got 72 recommendations. So, um, you know, some of that does come in, um, but we did have a particular focus. And I've got my cousin over here, Scott Avery, talk about disability. You might want to raise a FASD question from the First Nations Disability Network. Scott Avery. Thank you, Thank you Josephine. Just preempted my comment. Um, one comment, then one question. Uh, the first is the Telephone Kids Institute of today released the diagnostic guidelines for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. The next stage is dissemination, so perhaps something we can talk about um, offline. Um, but my observation is when you're talking about coordinated victim support, when we talk to the Family Violence Prevention Legal Services, the kind of things that they need to support women and children around, are, is to, it's not just the criminal issue, it's finding tenancy, finding, finding housing. Um, they're almost grief counsellors, trauma support. Uh, they have to deal with banking. So my question is, I, I, a lot of these, when I, when I come to these things, it's almost seeing as that the criminal justice system is the focus of coming up with this when I think the, the need is quite diverse. So my, my question is, how, how confident do you think uh, uh, answers gonna come to these um, quite complex problems? And, and how do we have to bring various parts of the support sector together, not just the legal justice system, to find a, a comprehensive solution to some of these things? I agree with with what, and it's funny because in in Lani's case, the welfare issues played a bigger part than anything. So when the Attorney General released her address, um, we had to, I had to help her um, become her own advocate and contact the local member who contacted Bob Davis. I personally, when I was a prosecutor or in that area, didn't find the domestic violence service is very responsive. It may have been because they were overwhelmed. So a lot of those welfare matters really affect whether a victim will come forward and follow through. So if they're not, you know, I've, I've said to the Human Services Minister, any, anybody who's going through a trial shouldn't have the normal reporting obligations to Centrelink. I mean, that just makes sense. Um, there's emergency payments that Centrelink can make to victims in remote community. They're covered with a lot of red tape. Um, all those issues um, can really affect um, the welfare issues, um, you know, childcare issues, um, homelessness can really affect. And I'll just get Marcia to. Yeah. So, so we've recommended one-stop shops. And, you know, one of the things we've recommended, and, you know, we're still looking at this, and it really would require a fair bit of um, um, federal, state, territory cooperation. Um, uh, one thing we've looked at is, say, for instance, social the Social Security Department has, you know, welfare officers. If those per welfare officers or, you know, social workers became the, the coordinators for the range of services that victims need, you could then address, as you say, the housing, um, their income, 
because, you know, if they leave, if they have to flee the home with their children, they're not getting any income. They usually don't have any control over their bank accounts. The husband removes all the money. Um, the husband cut, closes the, or the partner closes the bank accounts. Um, so you need, um, you need to have a, a social worker who can open a bank account for the woman, make sure that the emergency payments are deposited as a matter of urgency, uh, that she is housed, uh, that her children are able to go to school so, so that they, their schooling is not um, interrupted. Um, she will usually be under some kind of threat. Where can she live out of the range of the people who are threatening her? Uh, and their children likewise, it, you know, the children are often kidnapped. Um, she might be abused in, um, you know, the district where she lived. She might be abused going to the shop or, you know, to the post office. Where can she live safely without abuse? Because she's already traumatised. She has to go to court. Um, so she'll need a lot of services. She'll also need trauma counselling probably. Um, there aren't enough trauma counsellors, as you probably know. Um, now, when you're talking to the experts, many of them don't know what services a victim requires. They don't know where to find the services. And we've, we've noticed a kind of uh, an imbalance, um, uh, if I can put it as politely as possible. The NGO sector argues strongly for funding to provide services, um, and that's, you know, fair enough. But at the same time, when you take a problem to the non-Indigenous sector, I mean to the, to the non-government sector, they don't want to concentrate on the, the practical issue. They can't actually provide any accommodation um, and they can't actually provide any support to the victims. Um, they say that their hands are full, um, but, you know, they're not innovating um, and they're not cooperating and they become very isolationist. So... Uh, it's a problem that we have not been able to analyse, you know, and investigate properly, but it's clearly a problem. Um, and yet the mainstream services, the police, social security, um, hospitals, um, social workers, these, these services need to be coordinated and the NGO sector's not bringing them in fast enough and in, uh, you know, a co coordinated way to assist the victims. To go to your point about... Uh, somebody raised the point about... Um, um, preventative intervention with men. Yeah, of course it's happening. Well, guess what? The offenders get all the services. The victims are on the run, homeless, trying to hide their children, starving, no money. And still people ask us, oh, but what about the, the men? They're getting all the services. They get lawyers. They get counselling. They have a place to live. It might be jail, but they'll always get a place to live because all the services go straight to the offenders. We would love to have the money to do a, a, a financial analysis of the amount of funding, you know, overall that goes to offenders and the amount of funding that goes to victims and their children. Please don't ask us about the rights of offenders. We're getting a bit sick of, you know, why don't we talk about the rights of offenders? They get all the services. Talk to the lawyers who try to represent the victims. This is where the gaps are. This is where the problems lie. Why is there such an emphasis on the rights of the offenders and very little attention to the rights of victims? It just doesn't make any sense. Thank That's you. That's right. And there is some development around innovation in um, Northern Territory, WA and South Australia. They have a program called Support Link, which the Department of Social Services um, Commonwealth funded, which when a police officer goes to a scene, immediately a referral can be made both to an offender and a victim. And this system allows uh, the government to track the um, efficiency of the NGO sector. So it's going to be interesting space to see um, who's performing and who's not. So I think we have time for one more question. In the um, yeah, so lovely top we'll at the back. Just... Um, Mike, I, I share your concern about victims, but um, I just was also concerned about the fact that the fastest growing 
prison population in Australia at the moment is Indigenous women. And the research also suggests that a significant proportion of those, as much as 80%, have themselves been victims of sexual and physical abuse. So I just wondered about this, um, the need to be a bit careful to recognise that sometimes victims and offenders can be the same people, and to ask about how we might think about strategies to reduce the incarceration rate for Indigenous women, which seems to be a really important concern as well, not to dismiss any of the things that you've been raising, but uh, and also, also an important part of the issue. Um, I'll just keep it brief and then I'll let Marcia speak. The best, the, you know, if we want to enforce social norms, they have to be enforced at home. Yes, there are some female um, offenders who've been victims before, but why aren't they following the law? You know, the thing is we've got to make sure that at the point where children are young, they're going to school, they're living in a safe environment and social norms are enforced. Um, I was, I wrote an article for International Women's Day um, with my niece who rang me up from East Gippsland. She had taken on her um, brother's uh, son who was put into child protection. She was harassed, um, threatened with a knife, run after with a knife, rang the police and they wouldn't come. They said, we'll come tomorrow after we have an elders meeting. We have to consult the elders before you come in and protect a, protect a couple who are being harassed by a crazy man who's on ice with knives. I mean, enough's enough. The, the law has to be enforced in the same manner um, as it is everywhere else. The police have to be equipped with tools and cultural awareness um, training like they would with any other community. And the best way to prevent, you know, um, this lack of social norms is that the law is followed and that victims um, have the same access to justice as everybody else. Uh, look, I, I know you mean well in asking that question. Uh, but here's the thing, the, yes, the rate is high, but the actual numbers are small, right? So in the Northern Territory, for instance, which is the second worst jurisdiction for imprisonment rates in Australia for Indigenous people, the NT female imprisonment rate on 30th of June 2015 was 176 prisoners per 100,000 adult females compared with the national rate of 31 prisoners were per 100,000 adult females. The NT recorded the highest increase in female imprisonments and had the highest female imprisonment rate of all jurisdictions. But that would, you know, add up to roughly about 200 women in prison in the Northern Territory, 200 Indigenous women, and by and large they do very short census. But, you know, if you listen carefully to what we say, what we're describing... What we're describing is the environment in which they live is essentially a war zone, right? It looks and feels like a war zone. And if you're an Indigenous victim and you can't report to the police and you're getting threats of violence from the community because your male partner won't accept your behaviour and wants to commit violence against you, these, these women, these women victims are turned upon and they, are, they have to defend themselves somehow. And often these women become so traumatised that they become quite violent and they turn to drugs and alcohol. Um, and, um, you know, they're double time, they're, you know, twice over victims. So, you know, the thing is, if we want to make their lives better and, and stop a repeat of, of, of Aboriginal female prisoners and the, the rate of female prisoners growing, we have to overcome the cone of silence. We have to ensure that women can report um, assaults and violence and, that the, and we have to ensure that the police will come to the door and, um, and that they have access to all of the services that, you know, other Australian women have. Um, violence orders, uh, the protection of the police, uh, the perpetrator is removed from the household, um, charged if necessary. But, you know, the police won't even go to most Aboriginal houses. And people tell us these stories all the time. Um, and 
there will be no witnesses in a case because the entire Aboriginal community that's seen it just, you know, goes into silence. So women can't, you know, have no support. Again, it's the problem of the system and the victim requiring um, attention. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, also women commit crimes. Guess what? Women commit crimes. Um, there are a lot of young women who steal. Um, there are young women gangs in Alice Springs now um, and in other towns around Australia and they can be extremely violent um, because they've grown up in a terrible climate of violence where violence is normalised and that's what we're speaking to. We're speaking to systemic violence in our communities at a growing rate. And everybody's a victim. Everybody is a victim. We don't deny that. But, you know, we've got to... We have to explain it clearly and sensibly so that people understand what the problem is. And that includes court officers, court officials, judges, police, prosecutors, defence counsel, social workers, hospitals... Schools, school staff. The fantasies out there about this problem are part of the problem. Okay, thank you. Please.